Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Sea Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. Raising mace and bees has become a very popular trend. On today's show, Tom Theobald is going to be my guest to talk about what you need to know regarding the care of these fascinating creatures. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. I'm uh, looking forward to talking about the mason bees. It's been an interest of mine for many years now. And that's exactly why I thought you were the perfect person to talk to about this subject. Now, before we begin, for our listeners out there who don't know who you are, could you share with the listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, I spent the first 10 years of my working life in the corporate world and then uh, bolted, I guess you would say. I wanted to be outside, and I began beekeeping 43 years ago and was a commercial beekeeper, a community beekeeper for all of those years, and it was a significant part of our family income, and I did just about everything that had bee in it. I was the uh, president and one of the founders of the Boulder County Beekeepers in 1975. I was a president for 30 years. I was the last county bee inspector in the state of Colorado, the vice president of the Colorado State Beekeepers for a couple of terms. So I've done just about everything involved with bees in in Colorado and and nationally as well. Thank you. In regards to mace and bees, let's begin with some of the basics. Where do they come from? Well, mace and bees are a native bee. They've always been here. They didn't come from anywhere. And I came to the mason bees by way of another solitary bee that appeared early in my beekeeping career, and that is the alfalfa leafcutter bee, very significant economically for the pollination of alfalfa for seed. And I had a a bee yard on a ranch north of Niwot, and the first year, uh, Dorothy, the, the wife, said, Tom, your bees are eating my roses. I said, Dorothy... Honeybees aren't vegetarians. Let me take a look. So I took a look, and sure enough, there was a bee that was carving little ovals and circles out of her rose leaves. I did a little research, and I found that this was the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, and they used those leaf cuttings to form the cell in which they accumulate the pollen, lay an egg, and their progeny develop. So To keep Dorothy happy, I said, well, I'm going to make some bee boxes. These are cavity nesters, and they nest in straws, and I put them in the sheep shed, and I said, look, I'll take the population increase each year and help reduce the population that's foraging on your roses, and that kept her happy. And I did the alfalfa leafcutter bees for several years, thinking that I might get into the pollination business, but there's no seed production here in my region, and that faded away. And then I struck upon the mason bees, and the mason bees are a solitary bee like the alfalfa leafcutter bee, the difference being that the alfalfa leafcutter bee comes in the summer, the mason bee comes early in the spring, and are beginning to emerge Right about now, my bees are emerging right about now, and they have co-evolved with the early fruit bloom, particularly the cherry family, but they're good for cherries, apples, pears, peaches, and especially uh, useful for homeowners who may live in a subdivision and don't want to take on the commitment of managing a, a colony of honeybees Although they're only active for about four or five weeks and are only good for pollination of the early fruit bloom, 
they stay close to home. Their range extends maximum about 300 yards, about three football fields. Think of the distance of a block and draw a circle around your your acreage, your home, your yard. That's about as far as the mason bees will go, unlike the honeybees, which might forage out for a mile or two or even more. The mason bees are going to be occupied with the fruit bloom in your immediate backyard and your neighbors. So they've been here forever. They've co-evolved with the early fruit bloom. And just within the last 30 years or so, we've learned to manage them. And we do that by providing straws of the right diameter and the right depth the mason bees are, are what we would call tube nesters. And in the wild, they would, uh, they would nest in hollow reeds, uh, beetle burrows. They won't excavate their own tube. And the ideal depth, the depth that they like most is about six inches. So we provide six inch straws. And the queen does all of the work. There's no social unit. Every queen does her own thing, and they're what we call solitary but gregarious. They like to nest in conjunction with others of their kind, but each queen does her own thing. And she would go to the bottom of a straw, makes a little clay plug from moistened soil, clay, which is why they're called mason bees, then she will accumulate a small pile of pollen, lay an egg, then make another clay plug. That constitutes a cell. And a six-inch straw would have, on average, maybe seven or eight of those cells. And it's interesting, like the uh, queen honeybee, a queen mason bee can determine whether an egg is fertile or not. And if she lays an infertile egg, that's something called parthenogenesis. If she lays an infertile egg, that develops into a male. In the honeybee world, we call that a drone. So what the mason bee queen does, for the first three or four cells at the very bottom of the straw, she lays fertilized eggs. Those are going to emerge in a year as new queens. The last two or three cells will be males, and those males will emerge the following year two to three days ahead of the females so that they're active and mature when the females emerge and the females and the males mate, the males disappear, the females begin nesting. An interesting thing that they have evolved is the last cell will be completely empty. The cell out at the very end of the straw will be completely empty. Why is that? that well, that's a good question, and we've always wondered. And uh, we call that the vestibule. And we think that the reason that evolved the way it did was to deter uh, birds that would peck open the, that plug and take the larva if there were a larva or an adult developing bee in that cell. Because it's empty, it tends to discourage the foraging birds. That's what we think. That's what we think, why they do that. So, But it's just one cell, though. You would one think that cell. There would be, you would think that there would be more cells that were empty if it were a deterrent. Well... It's evolved as one cell, and almost every straw will be filled with cocoons, what will become cocoons, all the way up to the last cell, and the last cell will be empty. The last cell is the vestibule. Can you talk about the colony itself? Or do you refer to it as a colony, number one? No, no there, there's no colony. There's no social unit. They're solitary. Each queen does her own thing but gregarious. They like to do their own thing in conjunction with others of their kind. So by providing a, a container with multiple straws, and it could be anywhere from 20 to 100 straws, 
the the queen mason bees will use that those straws for nesting and each queen claims her individual straw works on it for two or three days as she fills it up with cells then goes on to another individual straw so they're all working in the same location but they're working independently of each other there's no no social unit and it's very interesting because their active life is very short, about four or five weeks. Here in our part of the country, they will begin emerging right at the end of March. By the first or second week in May, it's over. And for those of you who are a little older, it's for the next 10 months, it's like having a pet rock. Some of you will remember the pet rock. What you have is you have a straw that has the developing mason bees for next year in it the egg will hatch in three or four days that larva be consumes that pile of pollen and nectar and then spins a cocoon and begins to metamorphose begins to change into an adult bee and that change will take place over the course of the summer it's developing into an adult bee, and by the end of summer, by the end of August, we have what's called a pre-adult. It's a, a fully formed bee, but it has to, like many seeds, has to go through a cold period before the spark of life will reignite. So those straws are kept in an unheated building so that they have the natural fluctuations of winter temperature they go through a cold period and as we come into the spring and the days begin to warm that warming of spring is what brings them back to life again and they will emerge as i said here in central colorado right up against the rockies about the end of march and will be active for four or five weeks. Other parts of the country, that may come a little sooner or a little later. And mason bees are found from coast to coast. Slightly different varieties, but the same basic bee. It's very similar to that of a butterfly, if you think about it, because the butterflies go through the same process before they emerge. Well, it's the same for the honeybee. All, the, all of them go through the same process in their own special way. For the honeybee, that whole process takes place in a cell within the honeycomb. The queen lays the egg, the nurse bees feed the larva, and the larva spins a cocoon and pupates within the cell. For uh, a butterfly, the butterfly female lays an egg usually on the bottom of a leaf, the egg hatches, and for the food for the butterfly larva is vegetation. So they start eating the leaves until they reach the point where they're ready to spin their cocoon. And their cocoon is usually exposed. It's out in the open, maybe hanging from a stem. or So they go through that process. For the mason bee, that process takes place in cells within these straws, within the tubes. Tom, how can you identify the cocoons? Say if you're out and about and you're doing some work in your house or say if you're in the woods, how can you identify mason bees? Well, you probably won't see them unless you happen to break open a, a stem. There's something called the common pond reed, Phragmites, that is a favored uh, habitat for the nesting females. Uh, if you... Uh, well, I had a, a box with straws on the backside of the chicken coop, and the siding had vertical grooves, okay, up and down. And the mason bees had utilized that groove behind the box, between the box and the siding of the chicken coop, as as an additional tube. And they laid their their made their their cocoons in there. Most of the time, you're not going to see the cocoons. They're small, maybe the size of a pea, gray in color to dark, uh, a little fuzzy. You probably will never see them in the wild. How can you identify an adult? For example, I know a lot of people will 
see a fly and think that it's a bee. Can you also explain the difference between the physical attributes of a mason bee and a honeybee? A mason bee is a little smaller and more rotund than a honeybee. It's a kind of a fat little bee, and it's dark in color and has a sort of a blue-black iridescence if you look and the light is right. It's got a sort of an iridescence. What, as a kid, we used to call a blue bottle fly had that sort of iridescence. Uh, you can watch for them in your fruit trees at this time of the year in almost any part of the country, and they're noticeably different than the honeybee. They're more evenly colored. They're not striped like the honeybee tends to be, and they're their actions are a little more furtive. They move very quickly from one flower to another. They don't linger too much the way the honeybees would. The best place to see them in the wild would be at this time of the year, particularly in your cherry trees, if you have a cherry tree in your backyard, or any of the early fruit trees. If you watch for a while, you'll find that the, the mason bees, if they're present, are working in the flowers. Are their nests susceptible to moth infestations similar to the honeybees? Well, I've always said about the honeybees, the honeybees are livestock, and anytime you have livestock, you have a dozen things out there that want to eat it or made it, make it sick or do something to it. And mason bees have, in, have acquired their own pests and parasites. Um, Chalk brood, which is a, a problem for honeybees as well, can become a problem. Uh, there are parasitic wasps that will prey upon the larval and pupal stages of the, of the mason bee. Uh, the system that I use for propagating the mason bees is basically a two-part system. And it consists of a straw, a paper straw, just a white paper straw, six inches long and the right diameter, and that straw slips into what's called a guard tube. The guard tube is heavy, of a heavy cardboard kind of construction. And the reason for the guard tube is to prevent the monodontomerous wasp from drilling through the side of the cell, through the straw, with their ovipositor and laying an egg. That egg consumes the larva of the mason bee. So the guard tube is there to prevent that. The straws are reusable, or the guard tubes are reusable. The straws are replaced each year. The bees that have developed are allowed to escape from the straws. The straws are destroyed, and in that fashion, we stay ahead of some of the other pests and pathogens that will develop with the mason bees. So yearly uh, exchange of straws is a way that we stay ahead of the problems, and that's part of the management. How expensive is it to raise them and care for them? Well, there's a little uh, investment in the straws and the guard tubes, but that's minor. A straw probably for the average person buying them in small quantities might be 15 to 20 cents a straw. The guard tubes, a similar expense, but the guard tubes, again, are reusable year after year. And then you need some sort of little house to shelter the straws that you're putting out. And it doesn't have to be anything sophisticated. You can find them in on the Internet and in the catalogs. They look like an, a birdhouse with an open front. But anything that will protect the straws from the weather is adequate. It could be a coffee can. I use uh, poly pipes, the white poly pipes of various sizes as, as shelters for the straws. They work very effectively and are, are very inexpensive. Um, I usually recommend that people put them somewhere near a window where they spend a great deal of time so that they can watch them coming and going because that's part of the fun of it. Do they sting? They can sting. I think it's rare that they do, and I think you would really have to work at it to get them to sting. They uh, they just don't sting. And I've read that 
the sting is very insignificant, nothing compared to a wasp or a honeybee, uh, just an irritation more than pain. And I've never been stung, and I've spent hours standing in front of a nest box watching the females coming and going, and they just fly around you and avoid you, and they never take any initiative. So they're good for anyone who's uncomfortable around honeybees or stinging insects because they simply do not sting. What tips do you have for our listeners who are interested in raising mason bees? Well, we've just passed the window of opportunity for them to start this year, but this, on the other hand, gives them the opportunity to spend the coming months doing a little investigating, understanding what's involved with the mason bee husbandry, which is minimal, and uh, and being prepared next February to get the equipment that they need. And there are outfits on the Internet that will supply mason bee cocoons. Or, uh, in my case, on a local level, I sell uh, mason, bee coco- mason bee straws every year for people who want to get started. <clears throat> I've done the mason bees probably for over 30 years now, have finally built the population to the point where I have a surplus, which I can sell, and I'm introducing new mason bee keepers to the mason bees, in part to help uh, divert some of the people from beekeeping who really probably shouldn't be beekeepers. It... Uh, Either they just don't have the natural inclination or it doesn't fit into their their life schedule. They have children. They have obligations of various kinds. And having a colony of bees or more than one is a, a fairly substantial obligation. You have to organize your life around what the bees require. And the bees set the timing. And what happens all too frequently in this modern world is that a soccer game or a dance class competes on a warm sunny day when the bees really should be tended to like at this time of the year in the springtime and that gets postponed and it may get postponed two or three times and then that becomes a problem and that first problem becomes three problems become six problems, and it becomes very discouraging. The bees bees set the timing, and for the people who think that they're going to integrate a colony of bees into their schedule (laughs) are off on the wrong foot to begin with. So the mason bees are sort of a middle ground. It doesn't require that kind of year-round commitment and husbandry that a colony of honeybees would, and uh, yet gives them an opp- the people an opportunity to become involved in the pollination game and contribute at least a little bit. It's an excellent way to get children interested in pollinating insects, in insects in general. And I encourage parents, young parents, to do that if for no other reason than to see if it piques their children's interest. I couldn't agree more in regards to your comment about how it is a huge commitment and you see it all the time. People that will purchase fish in a, in a pet shop or buy a puppy or adopt a puppy or even cats and the animals wind up neglected because their own lives take over. Their lifespan is so short to begin with. It really is a big commitment for a very short period of time, but it is a wonderful experience. And folks, if you do have the opportunity to do so i highly recommend that you look further into it tom thank you so much for your time today i have received so many questions about raising mason bees and it's been a wonderful opportunity to share something that you love so much with our listeners yeah i would encourage the listeners who are interested to do a little investigating and then in the middle of next winter, we can do a follow-on program and cover some of these details and, and uh, help inform those people who think they want to give it a try. It's, a, it's just a, another one of the curiosities of life, and uh, 
I enjoy working with them. They seem to be escaping up till now, escaping the effect of the pesticides that have been so devastating to the honeybees. Uh, perhaps because they come so early in the season, perhaps because their active life is, is so short, only a month or so. But uh, they seem to be prospering nicely, at least in my little world here. Thanks for taking the time to explore this question, June, and I'm sure there are a lot of people out here that will find this very interesting, and uh, thanks for everything you do with regard to the honeybees as well. Well, thank you, Tom, and folks, tune in to another series that Tom and I actually co-host together called the Neonicotinoid View, which is a weekly program that focuses on the impact of neonicotinoids on the environment. Folks, if you have any questions, please reach out to us at questions at theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.